So, ladies and gentlemen, Shafti Meister, welcome to uh, tonight's event on behalf of the Scottish Polish Cultural Association. Uh, the SPCA hosts, a, un, in normal times at least, hosts a variety uh, of events on uh, various different topics, including uh, music, poetry, literature, lectures, uh, social events, and much more taking place in Edinburgh or some cases further afield. If you'd like to like, uh, learn more about the SPCA, uh, just take a look at our uh, website, scottpulse.co.uk, uh, or our Facebook page, or you might even consider joining the association if you're not already a member. Uh, it's only 10 quid, and you'll be the first to know about upcoming events uh, such as this one. We're also grateful, uh, as with many of our events, for the uh, financial support from the uh, Consulate General of the Republic of Poland here in Edinburgh. So for the talk this evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we'll be uh, muting everybody again before uh, Jenny begins. Um, so if your phone rings or dog barks or kids burn the house down in the background, it doesn't matter, we won't hear. Uh, so you can uh, deal with any things that come up. It's not going to be a problem for anybody else. So the talk will last around about 45 to 50 minutes-ish, uh, which will be followed by questions and answers. And um, to ask a question, you can either write it in the chat function, as some uh, people already have, uh, and I'll just read it to Jenny during that. Or uh, if you want to ask your own question, just say, I'd like to ask a question, and we'll add you to the list. Um, Asking your own questions is absolutely fine. We just ask if you could keep them reasonably concise, business-like. Um, that way we can get through as many questions as possible from different people. Um, and I would strongly recommend, if you have a question, if you write it down, uh, either on a Word document or a piece of paper, whatever is most convenient. Um, again, that way uh, things will be more efficient and we can uh, run the Q&A more smoothly. I think you've heard more than enough from me, ladies and gentlemen, so I'll hand over to somebody much more interesting, a um, postgraduate a postgraduate researcher at Queen Mary University in London, a teacher, a historian, and most importantly of all, a, a big fan of the great man himself, General Stanisław Matek. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to hand you over to Jenny Grant. Uh, uh, thanks, Keith, and a huge thanks to you and the Scottish Polish Cultural Foundation for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm just gonna start sharing my PowerPoint. I wouldn't be a teacher without a PowerPoint, would I? Um, so give me two seconds to do this seamlessly. There we go. Right. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna be talking this evening about General Maciek and the soldiers of the 1st Polish Armoured Division, whose ties to Scotland are particularly strong. Um, in particular, I'm going to be examining the difficulties that the Poles faced as an army in exile um, from practical difficulties uh, relating to language and recruitment uh, through to the cultural challenge of trying to adapt to a new host country, um, while also seeking to preserve one's own sort of sense of self and cultural identity. So there's going to be a mixture of the military and the social, um, which risks pleasing absolutely nobody. Um, but it does reflect the dual challenges that the Poles face on a daily basis. Now, <clears throat> I need to start by giving a quick overview of the actual journey taken by the Poles from Poland in 1939 through to the difficult choice which they faced after the war um, of returning to a Poland under communist control or remaining in a Britain which is increasingly hostile to them. Um, to describe this journey, I'm going to enlist the help of the rather dashing young soldier in the top right, um, Anthony Richtage, um, whose account of his journey was discovered in the archives in Breda uh, by my Dutch friend Ilsa. So here we go. We have his beautiful writing on the left, and I've included a map on the right um, to help you um, in case your knowledge of geography or, or, or anybody's, these journeys are pretty formidable. Um, so his account begins. After the war in Poland in 1939, uh, many of the Polish people went away from Poland because they expected it to be slavery for them, or the prison camp in Germany, or Russia and hard work, and he means forced labour. And also, I did the same, and I had left my motherland on the 4th of um, December 1939, and I went through the frontier of Hungary. Now, December was relatively late. Uh, most of the army and intelligentsia had begun to cross into Romania or Hungary 
uh, from the middle of September after the Soviet Union invaded from the east. Um, from Hungary then, uh, Riktaj travels to Yugoslavia. He then takes a boat to France where the Polish army was being rebuilt by General Tchaikovsky. So by May 1940, so just six months later, uh, this army consists of two full divisions. There's two in the process of being formed. We've got Maciek's own armored cavalry brigade. We've got the Potalian brigade. And it's part of the Potalian or the Highland brigade that Riktaj is sent to Narvik as part of the Norway campaign. And then he arrives back in France from Norway in June 1940. Now, anyone with a cursory knowledge of the Second World War uh, will know that France is not a great place to be in June 1940. Um, she'd just been invaded by, by Germany on the 10th of May, and she's days away from surrendering um, when Riktaj arrives. And either Riktaj individually or his unit, we're, we're not quite sure, um, zips back to San Malo, or they take a boat to Jersey and then on to Weymouth. Um, and then they get the train up to Scotland where the Poles were regrouping yet again. Now, Riktaj's story is a little different from the experiences of the majority of Poles who did manage to escape um, because they ended up being evacuated from the Western and the, the Southern coast of France as part of Operation Ariel. Um, Riktaj um, on the second page um, says, here in this lovely country and between so good the Scottish people, we are one year and nine months, and we are all getting well together. It's very charming, and it's very much designed to win over the teacher. So well done, Antoni. So the Poles who arrive in Scotland in the summer of 1940 have had a pretty demoralizing, uh, traumatic nine months. They've left behind homes and family. They've experienced military defeat twice at the hands of the Germans. Uh, they're welcomed by the Scottish people is this incredibly appreciated and unexpected. Um, they would spend the next three years stationed in Scotland before they were able to return to the continent and fight in the Northwest Europe campaign. And before they leave for the continent in the summer of 1944, um, many Poles actually post their belongings for safekeeping to Scottish families with whom they develop friendship. So this photograph here on the left shows General Magic, or, or at least a statue, um, which sits outside the city chambers in Edinburgh. It is General Maciek who transforms the first Polish Corps into an armored division, uh, which then goes on to liberate towns in France and Belgium and the Netherlands uh, before playing a key role in liberating German camps and occupying Germany itself. Um, the Poles who were fighting in the timeless phrase um, were fighting for our freedom and yours. Um, but they wouldn't have the opportunity to return to a free Poland until 1990. Um, General Maciek himself um, lives in Edinburgh until 1994, when he dies at the extremely venerable age of 102. Now, interestingly, Maciek's journey to Scotland takes longer than that of many of his men, and he has to travel via Casablanca and Lisbon before reaching Scotland in September. And the first word he uses to describe Scotland in his memoirs is rainy. So I am reliably informed that no talk on Polish military history is complete without a reference to Wojtek the Bear, who famously um, lived out his days um, at Edinburgh Zoo. So here he is um, being hugged by my girls. Right. So the key thing that we can pick out from um, Rick Taj's English homework and his English assignments is the extent to which language and communication difficulties would be a major problem uh, for the Poles as exiles. Um, this slide again was shared um, with me by um, somebody on a Facebook group. Um, it shows a few snippets from his father's notebook, which he carried around with him in Scotland. Um, you can see the phonetic spelling. Uh, what is your name? Um, how do you feel this morning? Um, give me please three pencils. Um, okay. Uh, now, the Poles very much prided themselves on being the first of the Allies to fight Hitler, but the nature of the war meant that after France surrendered, English was the dominant language of command and communication in the West, and it was compounded by the fact that the Poles were now based in Britain. So, what languages do the Poles speak that could sort of facilitate um, this? Well, Poland, when Maciek was born in 1892, just didn't exist. It had been partitioned in the late 18th century, it's now split between Russia, Austria, Hungary, Germany. Um, many Polish families therefore spoke several languages. So Polish at home, though not necessarily. 
And then the language of the partitioning power, as well as perhaps Ukrainian or Belarusian if they came from the Kresi region. Um, at school, they would study either German or French, if not both. And while English was offered in some schools, it wasn't widespread. And it's interesting, um, if you read the memoirs of Polish generals such as Maciek and Sosabowski, that they don't even feel the need to mention that they speak German. Uh, both men had been born in Austria and Poland, and they serve in the Austro-Hungarian army during the First World War. Now, we'll just move on to the next slide here. Um, this is actually really helpful when Maciek's brigade is ordered to cross into Hungary in September 1939. Um, the Hungarians said that they couldn't themselves um, offer military assistance to the Poles uh, without incurring the displeasure of Nazi Germany, um, but they could turn a very unofficial blind eye to Polish attempts to escape to France. Um, but this depended very much on the relationship that the Poles could strike with the individual Hungarian camp commanders um, as the Polish army units had been interned when, when they arrived. Now, Maciek gives three examples of, of how this could take place um, in his memoirs. So he quotes the case of Colonel Dvorak, for example, who had served in Austria, he spoke German, and he and the camp commander would reminisce about them both having attended the same training course at the same academy. So in his case, escape was relatively easy. Um, we've got Paul Major Swatinsky, however, uh, things are less easy. Uh, he, he speaks very little German, no Hungarian. So he relies on drinking heavily every night with the camp commander um, in order to overcome the language barrier. And this pays off eventually. Uh, they're seated at bar and the chief of police um, comes over to the commander's table um, and gives him details about the timing and the position of the patrols each night, um, which obviously gives Swadinsky a heads up on how his men can best make their escape. And the commander famously leaves over to Swadinsky and says, perfect, mon ami, but no more than 30 men at a time. Now, how does Maciek himself escape? Um, well, it's all down to Mrs. Maciek, actually. Um, he'd been fortunate that he'd been reunited with his wife and his children in Poland uh, just before crossing into Hungary, and he's interned with his family. And it's his wife who persuades the camp commander that she needs to visit Budapest to see a doctor. Um, I'm hoping she uses the phrase women's problems. Um, once she gets to Budapest, um, she secures paperwork from the Polish embassy for Maciek and his officers, and she manages to get her hands on civilian clothing. Um, which she then transports back in a suitcase. And then when she returns to the camp, Magic's able to change out his uniform. Um, they managed to escape from the camp, uh, walk several miles to a distant station because the local station is being monitored. They buy tickets for Budapest. They take the train onto Italy and then onto France. Now I have on the slide a couple of examples of the documents, um, which one of which is the Polish legations were producing for the Poles. Um, Polish authorities are absolutely um, doing everything they can to facilitate the Poles reaching France um, to the point of producing all these fake documents. Um, this one here, um, the, the man is identified as an engineer. Um, engineers and mechanics were pretty much the standard profession um, they gave for former army officers, effectively. Um, on the right, we have an identity card um, from Romania. Um, again, he's down as a mechanic in this case. Um, and this was, you know, could be purchased by the exchange of cash, for example. Um, but the point is that the Polish army that rebuilds in army was the result of this being carried out, this form of escape, um, a thousand times by individual soldiers. Now, um, the French episode, the stay in France, um, because it's, it's relatively short, it's kind of seen as a sort of prelude um, to the arrival in Britain. But obviously for the Poles who arrive, this is the new normal. This is where they think they will regroup and relaunch um, the attempt to, to, to take back Poland. Um, and we see them sort of rebuilding sort of cultural associations and so forth. Here we've got a, a photograph um, of the Poles in um, French uniform um, with these little girls in sort of the Polish um, costumes. Now, the vast majority of Polish officers uh, by 1939 also spoke French, um, partly because it was um, the social thing to do, um, but also because the Polish and the French military had a close relationship in the 20s. So French officers often taught um, officers in Warsaw, and many officers such as Sikorsky had also studied in Paris. 
Um, so when the Poles arrive in France, they've already got uh, relationships with many of the senior French officers. But interestingly, a lot of the French officers also spoke Polish at some level. Now, the difficulty that arises with France is that the Poles, having come straight off the battlefield and encountered German tactics and German mechanization, um, find that the French assume that the Poles have been defeated purely because of poor training and tactics, not that they were outgunned. Um, and this, alongside this widespread resentment on the part of many French people, that France had been dragged into this war because of Poland, means the Poles have a very dispiriting time in France. Um, General Sosabowski really, um, he of the, the, the parachute brigade, objects to the fact that the French instructors insisted on teaching tactics better suited to the First World War um, and that their, the Poles' more recent expertise was being ignored. And he talks about how one of the French officers, Polish, wasn't particularly strong. So he's able to translate or mistranslate for his men. And he says, I took advantage of his lack of Polish and translating his 1918 ideas into Polish 1939 methods, I overcame his defeatist attitude. Now, my First World War historians among us will point out that France actually won in 1918, but we'll move on. Now, when the defeat of France looked certain and Sikorsky agreed with Churchill that the Polish army could reassemble in Britain, you've got a new level of communication problems. So very few Poles spoke any English at all, but rather surprisingly, you have these little pockets of British people who were familiar with Polish. Um, so for some men, for example, they had been um, German prisoners of war during the First World War, and they had then worked on Polish estates. Um, General Ironside had fought with Polish soldiers during the Russian Civil War, and is remembered fondly um, when he visits Warsaw in early 1939. The Poles are obsessed and absolutely tickled by his surname. It's very sweet. Um, you've also got a small Polish community um, scattered across Britain, far smaller than it had been in the mid 19th century, for example. Um, it's concentrated in London, Manchester, Lanarkshire. Um, I'll just move on. Um, so you get a really interesting insight into this um, by the example of the SS Athenia. Um, so this is the first British ship to be sunk in the Second World War on the 3rd of September. Um, and some of the survivors are picked up by a Norwegian ship and then brought to Greenock and then to Glasgow. And 60 of the survivors were Polish, uh, probably Polish Jews. And the Glasgow Corporation organizes a visit to Loch Lomond for them. And the Scotsman reports that several citizens who speak the Polish language are acting as interpreters and helping in the arrangement for the comfort of the refugees. Now, in 1940, when the Poles begin to arrive, um, they've arrived in the middle of the summer holidays, um, which means that there's quite a few teachers and students available, and they offer to give up their time to provide really basic English lessons um, to the Poles. Um, now, access to these English lessons varies from unit to unit, um, as does the resources available. So there's a shortage of textbooks and dictionaries um, is the immediate problem. If you have a look at the image on the left, this shows the increasingly frantic reprints um, that a Polish English dictionary goes through once the Poles arrive in Britain. So March 1940, clearly they're wondering whether it was even worth their effort to publish this. And then we get April 1940, well, okay, August 1940, August 1940, November 1940, and then it eases off slightly. Um, language classes could also be held in the evenings. And um, we can see this inscription, um, in the photograph on the right, um, it says to Miss Lumsden, as a small token of our gratitude for your very kind help with the English classes for Polish soldiers and our sincere appreciation of all the hard work and late hours incurred um, by her for our sake. Um, now, Molly Lumsden um, would go on to be head teacher of the Hill Primary School in Blair Gowrie. Um, becomes a leading member in the Scottish Women's Institute and, and they've actually been really helpful and, and give more details um, about her life. Um, okay, so lessons normally took place using what's called the direct method. So you hold up a knife and say knife. Um, French could be used as an intermediary language um, if it's spoken by the teacher or, or the students. And um, sometimes we have school kids helping and um, with their school, school French. Um, Krasinski, who I'll be talking about in a second, um, talks about the difficulty in persuading Poles to pronounce the accurately. And he talks about 
The whole group spent many hours trying to learn the trick and drops of sweat stood out on their foreheads as they said for the hundredth time, like so many buzzing bees, it was much harder work than the morning drills. Um, other Poles try to teach themselves English by reading newspapers. Uh, one's able to score an English German dictionary and teach themselves English through his own second language. Um, the most effective method of learning a language is obviously sort of personal immersion um, outside of a primary language environment, or what we would more commonly refer to as the mattress method. Um, so we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, once they returned to the continent in 1944, um, the Poles ability to speak French comes into its own. Um, they were under the command of General Guy Simmons and the 2nd Canadian Corps as a Canadian medium artillery unit attached to the Polish division. Uh, so all of this means that French is used um, much more um, effectively than English uh, to communicate between these levels. Um, and we even get examples at Hill 262. And um, so you've got a photograph of this intense firefight um, when the Poles are charged with stopping the German 7th Army from escaping uh, to the east um, and are completely encircled and cut off. Um, and most of the speeches are, dear God, we've run out of ammunition, we're all going to die. Um, the Poles are encircled by German forces, but the orders are given in French for the benefit of the Canadians. Now, rather sweetly, um, the Poles are not, a bit like the Spanish Inquisition, they are not expected. Um, when they liberate towns, there's a, oh, the Poles moment. Um, so we've got a case where um, in Ypres they arrive and a citizen quickly consults them on how to write welcome in Polish so they could hang up a banner in the correct language. Um, they also create an ad hoc Polish flag by ripping the blue section off a French flag and turn it around. I've never been sure why this Belgian town has such a large number of French flags. I don't know. I like the story. I'm not asking too many questions. Um, there's also a really lovely episode in Tiel um, where the Poles advance into the town um, and the account says they sang songs that they had learned while training in Scotland. My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean and Annie Laurie. An excited partisan immediately painted a great sign. Welcome to our Scottish liberators. Um, slightly more poignantly, um, in April 1945, the Poles are on the Dutch-German border and they hear a rumour that there's a camp nearby in Oberlangen. And although it's behind German lines, there's a concern that the camp might be liquidated before the Allies arrive. Um, so an advance party sent out under Koschutsky, um, who's in the tank, and the tank rather pleasingly just drives straight over the barbed wire fence of the camp, and the Germans come out and surrender. And the Poles are astonished to be greeted by Lieutenant Jadwiga Mileska um, on the right of this, um, who had fought in the Warsaw Uprising. Um, and she is equally astonished that the Poles, the soldiers who are liberating the camp are Polish. Um, the camp contains uh, nearly 2,000 Polish women and babies um, who had fought in the Warsaw Uprising. And the entire division then descends on the camp over the next few days, offering them all the food that they can. Um, they're also frantically asking for news of their loved ones in Warsaw, because since many of them had left Poland in 1939, they hadn't had any communication um, with their families. Now, one of the further practical problems that faces any army in exile is that of recruitment. So the Polish army that's recreated in Scotland had very little in common with the regular Polish army of September 1939, either in terms of military experience or social background. And um, there's roughly 1 million Polish men under arms in September, roughly because we have men who are too old to really be considered even as reservists, um, coming and trying to join their units. We've got teenage boys, and then we've got lots of men who cannot reach their units um, because you've got the confusion of mobilization so late. Um, during the course of the September campaign, about a fifth of these men are killed or wounded. Two thirds are taken prisoner by either the Germans or the Russians. So we only end up with about 85,000 men reaching Romania or Hungary or the Baltic states. Um, so the army that then forms in France in 1940 has very little again in common um, with the 1939 army. And it contains huge um, numbers of volunteers. Uh, this photograph um, shows some of these volunteers um, from emigre communities in France, South America, as well as lots of Poles themselves. 
um, from Poland itself. Um, the nature of the journey meant actually that chance determined who managed to reach France. And for many men, it was easier to escape to French Syria across the Mediterranean than to actually take a land route to France. It very much depended on what boats were available. Um, and this is where we see the Carpathian Brigade being formed. Um, now, I've taken this um, from my grandmother's book of Polish marching songs. Um, now, the Carpathian Brigade um, forms in French Syria, um, but the actual journeys and the mixture of social classes um, very much reflects what we see in, in France on, on the mainland. Um, so if I translate loosely, please don't be too critical, um, it says we've come here from Narvik, we came from Hungary, from Czechoslovakia, many of us came from Syria, three of us escaped from Germany, we came across the sea from Flanders, uh, we came over the mountains and through the forest, and, and now here we are all together in Alexandria. Um, now, Savary Prashinsky, who is himself a writer who joins the Polish army as a volunteer, uh, describes the Polish army as it assembled, um, arriving in dribs and drabs. Um, oh, sorry, that's a little bit exuberant there, wasn't it? Right, um, he says the Polish army that arrives in France in the winter of 1939 was probably the queerest lot of men that ever carried rifles and learned attack, defense, taking cover, and the other secrets of the infantryman's art. There were in the ranks diplomats, including Mr. Liski, the former Polish ambassador in Berlin. There were also Polish miners from the north of France, um, some of whom had nearly forgotten their native language. Next to boys of 17 were found university professors of fairly respectable age. There were adventurous volunteers from the Foreign Legion, former legionaries in the Spanish army at Guadalajara, Polish settlers from Brazil and Peru, poets, artists, and writers made up a small but amusing group. There were priests and there were Jews. It was a kind of Noah's Ark collection with one common feature, they all believed in Poland. Now, Maciek writes that the only thing we did not lack in France were personnel who came from all walks of life and prodigious amounts of advice from the French on how best to set about forming them into an army. Um, the Poles really do not respond well to being told what to do by the French. Um, by June 1940, there were roughly 85,000 men in the Polish army in France. And after the invasion of Germany in May 1940, the Polish forces were split and many ended up being interned. Um, so many of the Polish troops who lived in France also returned to their families. Um, so only a quarter of the 85,000 um, reach Britain. It's almost as if the entire Polish army in the West has been lost. And um, this actually threatened Sikorsky's position. He, he's removed from power briefly. Um, now the profile of the new army in Scotland is far from ideal. It is far older than the average, and that problem will just get worse over the course of the war. And it's got a disproportionate number of officers. Um, the Polish Armoured Division is always under strength and had no reserves. And Maciek has to fight against the attitude of certain Polish commanders who doesn't think forming a division is viable. Um, Sikorsky visits Canada and America to encourage recruits, but not many respond. Um, they prefer to join the US Army when it enters the war. And it's not until the divisions joined by men from the Anders Army who'd been through Siberia that their numbers come anywhere close to that expected of the 15,000 in an armoured division. Now, it would have been infinitely easier and cheaper to form the Polish First Corps into an infantry division, um, but the very lack of men actually made it much more viable as an armoured division. And this, alongside this inavailability of Lend-Lease funds, um, means that this was Poland's only opportunity to create a modern armoured division, as she'd never be able to afford it during peacetime. Um, and the Poles are very much determined to play an active role in liberating their own homeland from the Germans. Uh, their experience in Poland 39 and France 1940 had convinced them that the only modern armor would allow them to do that. However, this was another difficulty faced by an army in exile. Uh, the strategic ambitions of the Poles were not of the highest priority to the Western allies. Um, and the Poles are dependent on the coast countries for access to even basic resources, let alone Cromwell tanks. Um, in France, this had been a source of significant resentment. 
Uh, Sosabowski recalls training his men with rifles that dated from the 1870s. Maciek speaks of having to use sticks to represent machine guns, a small stick for a light machine gun and a big stick for a heavy machine gun. Um, in France, the Poles are paid very little. Their accommodation is rarely better than a damp hayloft. There's no leather provided to repair their boots. And in Britain, there's a little sense that maybe it's going to continue. Um, they're first put up in schools and then camps in sports stadium. Um, and they're utterly dispirited. And then they're moved into these bell tents that leak. Um, the, this is a fairly extreme photograph um, from Scotland, um, but it does give a good indication of how miserable it was at certain times in this autumn. Um, Sosabowski um, describes the Poles in the autumn of 1940. Um, I'm not doing the accent. He says, we were even sent, humiliation of humiliation, British army cooks. After a few days, by which time the troops were almost on hunger strike, I asked if we could have the raw rations. We were not ungrateful, but my men just could not stomach British food cooked in the British style. To make matters worse, it rained continuously and we were all wet through and compared with France, it was very cold indeed. Um, moreover, the role which the British planned for the Poles of creating and reinforced a man in the coastal defence of Eastern Scotland didn't exactly tie in with the Poles' ambition of taking the fight to Germany. Um, and the static nature of the role was actually far different from what would be required of a mobile armoured division. Um, but the Poles respond in a professional manner. And um, the idea seems to have taken hold uh, that this was all the equivalent of asking the Poles to sort of sweep leaves without ever providing them with bags. So it was sort of tasked to keep them busy, which served no useful military purpose. Um, but the fall of France, the Battle of Britain had prompted a rethink of British defences overall, and coastal defence was being constructed all across Britain at this time. Um, the Poles are given the task of defending the coast from, um, if we quote Matic again, uh, from Aberdeen to Edinburgh, from Montrose to Dundee. Um, and the Polish engineers responded in an extremely thorough manner uh, to the task at hand. I know Alan Carswell attributes this to training and sort of the Prussian army and the Austro-Hungarian army. Um, Gordon Barclay in the wonderful um, If Hitler Comes book quotes a report by Major General Kosakowski, um, where he says that the existing defences, they have a look at them, uh, are neither a homogenous nor an accomplished character. That is, they're a bit rubbish and kind of thrown together. So instead, um, they do a full survey and he proposes that the task ahead will demand 57 new emplacements and obser observation posts, uh, 15 existing emplacements to be reinforced, the movement of 700 anti-tank cubes, which are famously very easy to lift, uh, 150,000 yards of wire obstacle to be created, 18,600 mines to be laid, and 5,000 anti-glider posts to be erected. Um, a reminder that I'm far more sort of uh, British than I'm English, um, sorry, Polish, Sosabowski quotes this rather brilliant example where the Poles set to work and are immediately berated by a local farmer for digging up his field. And he writes, I discovered that even in wartime with a German invasion reported imminent, I had to apply through the proper channels for permission to dig trenches on private land in order that the farmers could get compensation and everything could be properly arranged. Um, but the supplies begin to arrive and our poles begin to feel that they are being taken seriously and their morale rises significantly. Um, lorries are delivered, um, which allows the poles to actually travel more easily. They don't have to wake up quite as early to walk to training um, and they can vary their training environments much more easily. And we also get tanks beginning uh, to be provided. At first we're seeing Valentines and Covenanters, but by 1944 they've got access to the Shermans and the Cromwells that we would take to Normandy. Uh, Magic describes the, the Cromwells as magnificent. Um, the British are also generous with their training facilities. So from 1942 onwards, the Poles are moved from their role in coastal defence um, on Scotland's east coast down to the Tweed Valley. Um, and then they sort of station much more often um, around Britain, uh, sorry, England. Um, the training at Bovington, at Lulworth, at Newmarket. They're participating in exercises with Canadian and French armoured divisions. Um, and then they move to Scarborough and then to Aldershot before they um, depart for the continent at the end of July 1944. 
Now, let's go back in time a little bit um, to the Poles leaving France for Britain and look at the cultural chasm that exists between the Poles and the Scots. So the Poles were about to land in a country um, where almost nobody spoke their language and about which they knew very little. And this becomes apparent the minute they boarded the British ships and Polish ships that have been sent to collect um, the British and the Polish and the Czech soldiers as part of Operation Ariel in June 1940. So the Polish soldiers had made their ways in small units uh, to various French ports awaiting evacuation. Uh, this is just two weeks after the evacuation of troops from the beaches of Dunkirk, and it's extremely risky enterprise given the threat of German U-boats and attacks from the air. Now, I'm very evangelical um, about this little book here. Um, Prashinsky um, write, wrote this book, uh, I think it's produced in 1941-42, um, called Polish Invasion. It was republished um, relatively recently. Um, and it's just a very witty insight into the experiences of the Poles um, in Scotland. Um, so he describes here the Poles meeting the Scots for the first time on board a British cruiser um, anchored off Saint-Jean-de-Luz. Um, I know you can read it for yourself, but you know, I like to sound my own voice clearly. Um, the soldier who had just said goodbye to his girl slipped on the gangway and nearly fell into the water but he was held up at the last moment by a strong hand. As soon as he stood on his own feet, he turned to see his friend. He was a tall blue jacket, red haired and broad shouldered, grinning with white teeth. Polish, good, good. And then showing off, Polish, dobra. And he produced some cigarettes. Now the Poles hadn't been able to afford cigarettes in France. So this is actually quite a big deal. Um, the Poles, not to be outdone, searched for some English words and said, Englishman, good, good. I am doing the accent, aren't I? I need to stop. He was amazed to see the British sailor wagging his head in earnest, good-natured denial. No, no, Englishman, Scottish, Scotsman, Scotland. There was great surprise. The Pole, a village boy from Sandomierge, could not understand it at all. Each knew very little about the other, and what they knew was often untrue. The one took the other for a kind of Englishman and was rewarded by being taken for a kind of Russian. For the majority of Britons, Poland was primarily significant as a line in the sand for Hitler's aggression, rather than as a sovereign nation in whose fate they were really emotionally invested. Um, before um, we get to the sort of 1939, the Poles are a very fleeting presence in British newspapers, as you'd perhaps expect. Um, we see references to Polish crosswords as the punchline to jokes about difficult tasks. Um, Felix Topolski, who's the Polish artist who settles in Britain um, before uh, the war breaks out, optimistically suggests that the British public generally had a good appreciation of Polish music, being perfectly familiar with the names of Chopin and Szymanowski. By the late 1930s, with the opening of the port of Gdynia, we also see increasing amounts of trade taking place between Britain and Poland, and a number of British men learning, sorry, British businessmen, learning some of it Polish by virtue of investing in businesses in the country. Um, I'm gonna share um, slightly off topic, but I love this story. Um, it's from the Lancashire Evening Post. Now we do seem to have this idea of Poland being um, a little like Czechoslovakia in Neville Chamberlain's terms, a far away country. Um, so this is a story from 1933, and it follows the adventures of a Mrs. Seidman from Blackpool, who decides to visit her sister in Wutch, or Dodds, as one of the articles has it. Uh, she had emigrated to England in the 1900s, but her sister had remained in Wutch, and her nephew was now getting married. So Mrs. Seidman decides to attend the wedding, and her journey is reported as if she was visiting the Solomon Islands, rather than somewhere with fairly well-established train links. Um, the first story leads with a Polish wedding. A Blackpool woman is to travel 2,000 miles to attend a wedding in Łódź, Poland. This is page eight, this is not first, first page, so just, you know. Um, the second reports on how having made arrangements with the Blackpool post office, she's able to call home to Blackpool from Łódź. Um, Hello, Blackpool from Poland. And her son tells the Lancashire Daily Post that the line was as clear as if the call had been a local one. And he adds rather sweetly that Although she had not seen her sister for 33 years, they recognized each other immediately on a crowded platform. The third article tries to make the return journey a little more dramatic than it perhaps was, describing it as an almost record dash 
hustle by wedding guests and her son. Um, and they set out from Warsaw on Monday night and they arrived in Blackpool on Thursday morning. So by the autumn of 1939, um, British people had caught up a little bit more on Poland. Every newspaper editor worth his salt has done a profile of Poland, drawing heavily on encyclopedias that they have to hand and describing Poland's geography and economy, um, which in themselves are a pretty good explanation of why Poland is defeated. Um, but how does Britain actually respond to the arrival of the Poles? More tense. Um, so the king meets President Ratchkiewicz at the station in London to welcome him from France. But Britain is still reeling from the aftermath of her withdrawal from France, the fact that many of her units are in disarray. Um, so Scotland, and particularly the area around Glasgow, seems like a good place to put the poles. Um, land's relatively freely available for building camps, and there's pretty direct transport links. Um, Sosnobovsky um, mentions um, how the British liaison officers tell him that the citizens of Levin um, had been extremely relieved by the appearance of the Poles when they get there because they've been told that they were wild and civilized men. They really expected us to resemble Mongolian hordes wearing long haired sheepskin coats and riding through the streets flourishing sabres and spears. They had hidden their valuables and locked up their daughters. Um, the Poles are pleasantly impressed by the organization of the train links to Scotland, the provision of tea with milk, they all note, cape and cigarettes for free. Um, and the accommodation of the troops was helped by the fact that it was school holidays. So the first Poles to arrive were accommodated in schools, but also in these tents. Now, Sobowski, as one of the first senior officers to arrive in Glasgow, and immediately places all the Poles, including their wives, under lockdown. Um, until he's able to coordinate um, with the Scottish authorities. There's clearly a concern about allowing thousands of demoralised troops suffering from culture shock uh, loose on the city. Um, and then sooner after the Poles are moved out of the city to the camps, um, are sleeping in these bell tents that leak in the rain. But the Scottish community very much rallies around the Poles. Um, in the first place, um, they were delighted when the Poles marched through town singing Polish songs. And we, we can see them lining up here in the first couple of weeks. And um, they actually cheered them in a way that the French civilians very much hadn't. Um, Poles are invited to tea with local Scottish families. They enjoy the fish suppers that are provided by the Church of Scotland. They set aside denominational differences. Um, the pay of the Polish soldiers was significantly higher than it had been in France. And I think the fact that the Poles are able to pay their way after the first few weeks eases their entry into Scottish society. Um, we have charities such as Lady Warrender's Poland Armed Forces Comfort Fund, um, collecting donations of everything from socks to musical instruments for the Poles, um, many of whom are still wearing French uniforms at this point. Um, and we get the formation of the Scottish um, Polish Society. Now, fundamental to all these efforts is a woman who rarely makes it into the British books, um, might be a throwaway sentence, but her efforts to support the Poles as this one woman publishing dynamo um, greatly helped their integration. Um, so this is Jadwiga Harasowska. Um, she sometimes styles herself Jadwiga de Glasgow. I think that may be how she said it. Um, now she'd worked as a journalist and editor of glossy art magazines in Poland. And once she arrived in Glasgow, and um, she's one of only about a thousand or so Polish women in Britain, she quickly sets to work. She sees what the Poles need to adapt to life in Scotland, um, but also what the Scots need to know about the Poles. Um, and she fights really, really hard to ensure that the experience of exile doesn't diminish their sense of identity. Um, she speaks widely at cultural events, describing Polish culture um, to Scots, um, in lectures in many branches of the Scottish Polish Society. Uh, there's one meeting um, when she's tackling the potentially dull topic of the Silesian economy. Um, she arrives in full Silesian dress, um, breaks into Silesian folk songs, and then devotes her time to questions about Silesian cuisine, which does seem slightly off track, but okay. Um, she finds a Pol she, sorry, she founds a Polish publishing house, a bookshop in Glasgow, um, she publishes a regular Polish language column in the local newspaper. She co-authors the handbook to sport soldiers in learning English. And she co-founds the Scottish Polish Society with Sir Patrick Gollum, as well as the bilingual uh, weekly newspaper uh, of Nivo Przyjazny or, or Classical Friendships. 
Um, she also publishes the English language um, Voice of Poland publication. Um, we can have a quick look at its contents here. I've got um, a copy of the May 1942 edition. So on the front page, um, we've got a photograph of the Poles parade along Princess Street. Um, and we've got a profile of the Carpathian and Brigade at Tobruk, totally off topic, but they are the very coolest. When they find out that France is going to surrender, the expectation is um, that the Poles in French Syria will also surrender and they're not having any of it. Um, and not only are they having none of it, they nix the best horses and equipment from the French and cross over to British Palestine. Um, when we get to the next page, we have a fairly terrible poem um, underneath the photograph of a Polish tank unit. Um, and then we've got a piece about the horrors of German occupation for Polish women in particular. Uh, I mean, one of the surprising things about the, um, the period is how much um, information is passed between uh, the West and Poland through various routes. And so there is a full understanding of what the conditions are like in Poland. Um, we also see adverts for business in, in Glasgow. Um, leave is relatively generous for the Poles and they're able to visit Glasgow or Edinburgh over the weekends. Um, so we've got adverts here for various restaurants, dance halls, tailors. Uh, the Poles really objected to the shapes of British uniforms and had them taken in. Um, because they had both time and money, um, the Poles therefore have a fairly enjoyable stay in Scotland. Uh, they've got free bus travel, and um, you can see them loitering by this bus stop with intent. Um, and they're able to buy luxuries such as cameras, which is why we've got quite so many photographs of their stay. Um, Maciek also talks about a small Poland growing up around the Polish camps. Uh, partly because some families have been able to join the Poles in Poland, uh, sorry, not Poland, Scotland but also because of the cultural activities that continued. Um, the newspaper that would develop into the Jernik Polski um, began among the 10th Cavalry Brigade um, and Polish identity and morale are uh, supported by the presence of this Polish theatre group, uh, Lwowska Fala, um, who had escaped with the Polish army into Romania and followed them to France and arrive in Scotland and actually then follow them to um, Holland. Um, they are performing at Christmas um, 1944 in Holland for them. And they perform Polish songs and dance and variety acts for the Poles, I think over 800 times in Scotland. Um, and this photograph shows a performance actually in Scarborough. Um, Maciek um, quotes a link um, from a song by Viktor Bajinski, um, which shows how sort of significant this group was to Polish identity continuing. Um, so, which is even in Edinburgh, um, uh, for Edinburgh, um, you can find a part of Lavos. As a minor aside, of which we've had many, um, if we travel back to the autumn of 1940, we might well have seen the Polish soldiers diving into the local woodland in search of mushrooms. Um, I asked my Twitter followers for photographs of mushrooms and, and then replied with about 250. Um, so, so here we have, I don't know which are deadly and I'd hate to have your deaths on my hands, so please don't trust this slide on any level. Um, now mushrooms to a pole are soul food, they are manna from heaven, and um, they're very much a staple of Polish cuisine. And it's not that the Scots didn't eat mushrooms, but they didn't really go foraging for them. They might have collected field mushrooms and hung them up on, on strings to dry them. Um, Jadwiga Harasowska talks about when we came here first and told our Polish friends we were going to look for mushrooms, they regarded us with popping eyes. By the autumn of 1941, however, Scottish attitudes towards mushrooms have changed radically. Um, we've got an article in Glasgow Sunday Post, um, and they're reflecting on how our horror of mushrooms has amazed and amused the Poles now living amongst us. Uh, we get a number of articles appearing in Scottish newspapers advising of the nutritional benefits of this a uh, delicious food group, which is freely available, which was important during rationing. Um, and they advise readers to, to grab a pole to act as a guide to the best or safest mushrooms in the region. The Polish presence also has a direct economic impact on the Polish mushroom market, which phrases I didn't think I'd ever be saying. Um, Scottish mushroom growers are soon struggling to meet demand for mushrooms, and the price actually rises to five shillings, six pence a pound. Now, women. It was possibly um, Harasowska who produced a guide to Polish soldiers on how to behave in English society. And she advised them 
again, we're not certain it, she's, she's the author, um, to abandon the heel clicking and the bowing and all of the hand kissing, um, as these are customs that were deemed barbaric by the British. Um, these very customs, however, may well have been the secret of the Poles' success with British women. Uh, now, this is quite a sensitive area as after the war, um, there's quite a lot of anti-Polish um, attacks, um, accusing them of targeting and exploiting British women, which we kind of see targeting other immigrant groups much more recently. Um, but there is no doubt from the literature of the time, both British and Polish, that the Poles are disproportionately successful with women. Um, there's a number of reasons for this, um, discussed again at great length. There's a whole chapter on why the Poles are so very good with women. And he even compares them to other immigrant groups. It's not just a sympathy. No, 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 they do better than the Norwegians. Um, some of it comes down to the romance of the Poles as exiles, and um, some of it due to their dashing uniforms and their old fashioned manners. And um, some of it, Przezinski argues, was because the British men were positively just morose by comparison. Um, there are numerous jokes um, about Brits impersonating Poles in order to have a chance with British women. And there's even a court case where an Englishman took the charade a little far and ended up being convicted of fraud. Um, the issue of marriage, however, was particularly fraud. There's a huge number of obstacles lay ahead of the couple, um, not least language and religion. And um, Sosabowski quotes an example where a young couple came um, they were planning to get married. She was Scottish, he was Polish, and he wanted to offer fatherly advice. And he discovered that they didn't speak a word of, of each other's language, um, which I suppose is terribly sweet. Um, and he basically introduces an English exam for anyone in his unit who wishes to get married. Um, if you were a British woman and you got married to a Pole, um, you would have to give up your citizenship you would have to report regularly to the local police station as an alien and register. And there's every expectation that you would return to Poland with your husband, um, which given the devastation that's been reported must have been a very difficult prospect um, for parents and families. Um, there's also quite a lot of practical difficulties. Um, there's a meeting of Scottish registrars talking about the confusion over what permission is needed for any allied serviceman to marry a British woman. A lot of time spent discussing whether permission from a commanding officer was needed and whether this indicated evidence that the prospective groom was actually free to marry. So in the case of the Poles, it is extremely hard to prove that a soldier wasn't committing bigamy um, just because the records were no longer accessible. Um, but despite all of this, we have 1400 marriages um, by 1943. Um, we've got discussion of the need for support to be given to the wives and children of Polish servicemen and classes are run by the Scottish Polish Society for Scottish wives um, to teach them the Polish language, to teach them Polish cooking and medical skills and child rearing skills to help them rebuild Poland when they returned with their husbands. Now obviously we, we're coming to the end here. Um, it's one of the tragedies, obviously, that many of these Poles would never return to Poland. Um, as a result of the redrawing of Poland's borders at Yalta, the effective surrender of Poland to Soviet control, about half of the quarter million Poles in the British command at the end of the war chose not to return to Poland. Um, at the same time, attitudes towards the Poles are beginning to sour in Scotland. Um, once the Soviet Union joined the Allies in 1941, communist propaganda against the Poles found a fairly easy audience among many on the left, um, even after the discovery of mass graves of Polish soldiers, Polish officers, sorry, at Katyn. Um, in 1945, many of the Poles who arrived in Scotland were those who'd been conscripted into the Wehrmacht, um, and they were met with significant hostility, perhaps understandably, um, but we see letters appearing in the papers pleading for understanding and kindness to be shown to these men. Um, and they're asserting that they, they were unable to desert because there would have been retributions for their families back in Poland. We also see the trade unions begin to protest against the prospect of Poles entering the job market as competition, and we get the Poles go home movement developed. Um, and almost tragically, the, these um, campaigns often appear in towns in which Poles had enjoyed the strongest links. Um, so St Andrews and Levin and Peebles. Um, in Peebles, things get particularly fraught. Um, the council debates building a housing scheme on a Polish camp, um, and it then spirals into a, a demand for the Poles to return to Poland. Um, 
but rather cheeringly, and clearly written for the polls here, um, were the Polish staff colleges say, um, the polls responded with an economic boycott. Uh, they refused to attend cinemas, dance halls, hotels, pubs, um, and they predict that this caused a financial loss to the region of a thousand pounds a week. Um, so they're demonstrating their economic contribution. Local residents um, are very much split, um, but some of them get quite aggressive on behalf of the polls. They send open postcards to the councillor in question um, with the word swine or tripe written on it, and they hang a notice on his front gate which says, long live Poland, leave the polls alone. Um, however, it was actually the polls who leave Scotland. Uh, they disproportionately choose to find work in England, both because of the availability of work and because of this hostility. And the Polish population dwindles rapidly in the few years after 1945. Um, the exception is places like Edinburgh, which becomes a fairly genteel centre for officers such as General Maciek, who had had his citizenship stripped from him by the communist authorities in 1946. In 1954, Maciek wrote in the Orzeł Biały um, that a Polish soldier fulfilled his duty in the most commendable manner. He has not reaped the fruits of his toil yet. There is still a long road and a great sacrifice ahead of us. While Maciek um, did live to see the collapse of communism in Poland, many of his men did not. And the path that they had taken out of Poland and over the frontier to Hungary or Romania in the autumn of 1939, was one which had led to perpetual exile. Right, I'm going to stop it there and thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Please bear in mind I'm on a PhD um, which has a fairly narrow focus and also all the archives and libraries have been closed. So please bear that in mind if you're relatively charitable um, as we reveal the, the limits of my knowledge on this. Firstly, thank you very much, Jenny, for um, putting together today's talk and presentation and also for obviously presenting it uh, to us this evening. Uh, does anyone have, yeah, as Jenny said, does anyone have any questions like to start with? We didn't actually get any in the chat. Um, people might have been, uh, to, to en enraptured by the, the actual delivery of the, the main part itself to come up with anything. Um, but if you have anything you'd like to ask, um, just put it in the chat and we'll, uh, we can bring it up. Well, we can start off at the moment. Um, what's, so what actually brought you to the particular interest in Matrek and well, Polish forces in the West? Um, so, I mean, my family background is my uh, grandparents were both um, uh, Sibiraks uh, that they ended up settling in Bradford. They had the option of Argentina. They chose Bradford. Um, so I've had an interest in the Polish experience and sort of understanding that it's not something that is widely known outside of the Polish community. Um, and then with Maciek, it was, um, I went on a battlefield um, tour as a teacher a few years ago. Um, and I was researching the history of Ypres and found it had been liberated by the Poles and I had, this was completely new to me. Um, so I began sort of reading around it and just rapidly fell down the rabbit hole of reading his memoirs and everything else that's been, been written about the first Polish Army Division just because that sort of odyssey is just so compelling. Um, and you have all of the social aspects and the military aspects. And I mean, people like Maciek is just such an absolute hero he is an utter guru and a dude and he's fantastic so um yeah um and actually on on the point of matrix if uh, anyone wants more information on either himself or his unit or things because we largely talked about um equally fascinating social topics um but th this would also be a, a good time for any questions that members of the audience have uh, on on those kind of topics as well uh, the first question I've got, if you just give me a second, um, do, 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 was from uh, Michael. How many Polish camps were there in Scotland, if you know? Um, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Um, some. <laughs> 
and one of them had a boy tech staying with it and and that really is it um, i'm afraid what have we got uh, question from Alex. Um, what sources are you using for your research? Right. Well, this is an interesting story for those of us who've just started PhDs. Um, so obviously the plan is to get into um, the Polish archives, um, the, the Polish Institute in London. Uh, there's the Emigration Museum in Torun, for example. Um, at the moment, I'm relying primarily on the memoirs um, that are available in published form. Um, I'm also relying quite heavily on the newspapers um, to, to sort of give an insight. But yeah, I mean, this is the library I can access at the moment. So um, yeah, f feel sorry for the PhD students in your lives. Um, it's, it's a little desperate at the moment. But I'm very much, sorry, this is my little plug here, very much open to any documents, photographs, insights that you may have and um, that you would like to share with a humble PhD student um, who has no access to such things um, at the moment. And if people have those sorts of documents, uh, where's the best place for them to, to contact you to send them? Um, I mean, if you're on Twitter, I, I think um, you showed um, my, my um, handle at the beginning, it's at silence in Polish. Or if they could email um, you um, as a sort of intermediary, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Also, a reminder to everyone: um, it's it's absolutely fine if you'd like to ask questions yourselves. Um, again, just remember to, to keep them reasonably brief. Um, but for the moment, I'll just uh, continue the ones we've got in the chat. Uh, one from Maria: What's been one of our most uh, one of your most interesting archive finds? On the topic of on the topic of Matrix and the First Armored Division, um, that's a cruel question to ask. Um, I think there's um, a letter that I found um, from Matrix um, from France, um, and it was addressed to the officers, and it was there's very much this idea in his memoirs that the Poles were, you know. Yes, the living accommodation is not great and it's miserable, but they were fired up with, with, with you know, love of Poland to carry them through. And this letter is very much, guys, we've received all these complaints. It's got to the level of, you know, the French deputies being contacted about conditions and leave and pay. And actually, this is what we need to implement. And uh, the, the sort of stay in Poland is really, really interesting um, because they're, it's not being handled well at any real level. Um, so yeah, I, I think this sort of letter that sort of gives the lie to Matrix um, later writing is, is quite interesting. Uh, our next is from Professor David Worthington from uh, UHI, um, asking do, 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 uh, a question about the Voice of Poland, uh, the <laughs> magazine newspaper, something in between. Um, when was it first published? And how did it connect with the class of friendship? Um, they basically ran in parallel. Um, I think it's introduced, mm. I want to say 1941. Um, and this is very much, um, the editorial board is the Patrick Dolan and um, Yad Viga and all the sort of, um, sort of uh, senior Poles and the senior Scots. Um, and it's um, released on a sort of weekly basis. Um, so they, they essentially run parallel. Um, that there, there's no um, Polish in the voice of Poland. There was in uh, the um, Ogniwo, which is bilingual. Um, but yeah. Uh, the next we have is from Helena, or Helena, depending which country you're from. Um, did your grandfather speak about his experiences? And uh, did most uh, uh, Sibiraks join and not join Anders rather than Matrik? I assume that's rather than Matrik or Sosabowski. Yeah, no, okay, so it's so two. Um, that, so um, the first one, I mean, my granddad died uh, long before I, I appeared, um, but, um, you know, my, my grandmother lived with us. She was a driver in the Polish Second Corps. Um, so I've always been brought up by their photographs and, and books and, and the stories um, and, and Wojtek, I met Wojtek. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the, there's that side of it. But the actual, the military side, 
I, I kind of missed out on, and I, I feel not knowing uh, Jadek, um, and we've got his medals and so forth. So although we've got this book, I've sort of, you know, I, I didn't miss that element out. Um, and yes, um, most of the Anders army um, go on um, through sort of Palestine and then through the Italy campaign. Um, but there's also quite a few. So for example, the agreement they reach with the Soviet Union is that the Polish um, army will be a land army. So any airmen or sailors are brought out to Britain uh, to join the Polish Navy and the Polish Air Force. Um, but you've also got quite a few men who are brought over uh, to make up the numbers um, in the, the Polish First Corps. Um, not a huge amount. Um, and actually, um, some of them join um, the parachute brigade and, and some of them um, join uh, the armoured division. And in both cases, they talk about the the health of these men and this, you know, by the time they arrive, this is several months after they've been released from Siberia, but obviously the conditions um, within the USSR are, are pretty horrendous. And they spend quite a few months bringing them back up to health and they have to be very careful with their diet and so forth. So it wasn't a quick fix from a recruitment perspective and they have to be quite sort of careful with these men's health. Um, as well as the questions, we've also got lots of uh, obviously praise for your presentation. It's, it's uh, uh, content and the, the way it was put across. So um, again, on behalf of anyone, everyone, uh, thank you for, for putting all that together. Uh, particularly one from uh, Yezhen Isabella Made, uh, who said that their father was a corporal under General Marchek. Um, Next question, again, I emphasize, if you'd like to ask your own questions, uh, just write, I'd like, to, if you'd like to actually ask yourself, I'm sure some people are, are tired of listening to me by now, um, just uh, say you'd like to ask a question in the thing and we'll, we'll hand over to you. Uh, next from Kristina Shumalakova, um, how much information has been made available from Breda, where Matrak is uh, revered and indeed buried? Um, I'm honestly not sure. Um... A lot of the, um, there's Ilse who I was talking about, um, she shares quite a lot of the information that's available. She's been working in the Breda archives and she shares them. There's a First Polish Armour Division um, Facebook group. So there's, um, that's where a lot of these stories are shared um, by um, particularly sort of Dutch, um, you know, quite often it's the sort of grandsons, granddaughters. Um, Ilse's not related, um, but she sort of adopted the Poles. Um, so I'm not sure, I haven't had the opportunity yet to, um, I, I have a very strict schedule and, and Breda's in, in year three, I'm, I'm afraid, um, in detail. Um, but yeah, um, and some of it, um, these are sort of readily searchable and some are not. I, I haven't looked into Breda in particular, I'm afraid. Um, we have his, um, I think, um, Anthony Riktaj, I, I mean, he, he dies um, in um, Stekina, um, in, um, oh, I want to say, in the winter, um, uh, anyway, and um, he had sent his belongings. He's a bit of a journalist. He's we've got um, an article that he wrote um, describing um, his um, journey um, to to Narvik, for example. And this was left with a family in Blackburn. Now I've never been quite sure what the connection was, but they then I think sent his um, good belongings to his brother who returned to Poland, um, and then his brother. Um, donated them to um, the, the Breda um, archives and said, you know, he did, you know it, it's of most, most use here and this is where he's buried, um, along with Maciek. I think a, a lot of people with an interest in this topic, um, Breda is one of those places on the kind of pilgrimage list to get around to at some point, either for academic purposes or uh, just to just other items connected with Maciek's career. Um, Next question is from uh, Marek, written here as Morozek, I'm assuming Morozek or something along those lines. Um, I, uh, Marek is a volunteer guide at the Polish Institute and Sikorsky Museum in London. And is always amazed that visitors from Scotland uh, are often more informed than Poles who come over from Poland about Matrek's division. And do you have any insight uh, to why this may be? Um, I, I think there's quite a few um, things going on. I think I've talked before about sort of um, Polish memory existing in bubbles. Um, and uh, the Scottish, I mean, you've got sort of family connections and the Poles were there for such a long time and um, that you've still got people whose grandparents are remembering the impact that was was made. And this is something that's known about it in, 
I, I do find sort of the English interpretation of um, the Second World War and the home front really sort of erases the presence of all of these sort of armies in exile. And there's not just the Poles, you've got the Yugoslavians, Norwegians, you've got the Ethiopians, um, you know, there's all these, these sort of um, presence. You might get the Americans, obviously. Um, I mean, the best I've seen, I think, is um, in Bedknobs and Broomsticks, you've got that scene in, in Portobello Market, and you've actually got sort of Indian troops and so forth. But otherwise, it's very sort of um, Anglo-centric. And, and it's, it's a shame because, I mean, the Polish story is absolutely fascinating. And people at the time, you know, they are on the radio, they are appearing at theatres, you've got the Anglo-Polish ballet. I mean, they are a very visible presence um, throughout um, wartime Britain. Um, now, why it's not known in Poland, I mean, obviously Maciek, um, his story, you do have um, a lot of his men, uh, Shkodinsky, for example, um, go back, but there is very much no rush at all to celebrate uh, the role that these men had played. Um, they have been sort of, you know, absolutely sort of alienated and, and purged from um, the war effort. Um, so it's not until you really get to the 1990s that they are rehabilitated. And you end up with Maciek appearing on, on coins. And I know now he's got the sort of schools um, um, named after him. There's a sort of um, commemorative statue in, in Warsaw and so forth. Um, but I think it's very much that that history was just not told. It was actively um, stamped down upon. Um, but I think also, I mean, in England, um, you've got sort of these pockets like, you know, I'm coming from the sort of Anders background. Um, and people weren't that familiar with the, the Machet group necessarily. I think it very much depended on, you know, and when you'd socialise, you were socialised with maybe your sort of regiment and, and so forth. And um, so I, I do think it's, it's quite interesting that, you know, Edinburgh now has, has taken into his heart and, you know, you have the statue. But again, it was only really after he died that he achieved this sort of widespread recognition outside of the sort of Polish exile community. Um, so it is, yeah, it's it's just it's it's interesting. It's fun. You you briefly touched on a, a topic I'd thought of asking about, which was that my impression was that um, people of Polish Second World War descent in in Scotland are usually familiar with, or their parents or grandparents were from uh, Maciek's division or maybe Sosabowski's, whereas those in England were maybe more from um, Anders's forces. Uh, so that's again similar to what you were saying a minute ago. Is that the case in your experience or is there a fair amount of crossover? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose a lot of it's sort of patterns of immigration. So, I mean, like, you know, when Matek works as a barman, he's working in um, a hotel that, that's owned by one of his men. So that's fairly sort of standard. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, and as I say, you don't actually get at many polls um, settling in Scotland, given the numbers that have stayed there for, for a number of years. A lot of them end up moving to, to England. Partly, as I say, because of the availability of sort of, you know, the jobs in um, sort of textiles and so forth. Um, you do find, you know, some of them settling in sort of mining areas or, say, Edinburgh. But, it, you know, unless they really sort of marry, a lot of them end up, certainly a lot of the younger attached men either move to England or they go off to, to Canada or Australia, who are sort of trying to sort of encourage um, immigration. And our next question is from Yola Dembitska. Um, did you ever come across General Matrix's own war memoirs called Od Podwoda do Trolga, roughly translated from a horse-drawn carriage to a tank? I do. Hey. Hey, um, I've got the, yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, this, this is my, 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 my little, you know, come to die on, is his memoirs absolutely need to be translated into English. Um, we've got them in um, Polish, and then he wrote them in French, it's not an exact copy that there's little elements that he, he sort of includes in the Polish that he, he thinks maybe the French um, won't be as interested in. But the idea that that's not available in English is an absolute tragedy. And if anybody has contacts that can make this happen, please do, because that would be absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, because I mean, Sosabowski's memoirs, um, are, are, you know, Sweely I Serve, um, are absolutely compelling and really, really interesting. I, I do think that's one of the elements why the Polish story isn't actually getting better. I mean, I, I started on Twitter a couple of years ago just sort of sharing elements of magic story because it was the 75th anniversary of um, D-Day and the sort of Northwest Europe campaign. And the Brits were there going, oh, the Americans take all of the glory and the Canadians are like, nobody remembers us. And the Poles, uh, there's nobody, there was nobody. So, so that was sort of the gap I, I filled, you know. I'm still trying to sort of fight the cause that everybody should know about this division. 
Uh, it sounds like you volunteered yourself for uh, translating those memoirs to, to me at least, but well. Um, next question is from F. Doyle. Um, is it true that the British government failed to pay Matrek a military pension? And is it true that Breda paid him a pension um, on the quiet so as not to upset the British government? Yeah, I mean, that's my understanding of it. I mean, I, I don't think it was unusual that they wouldn't pay a military pension um, to any of the Poles. I, mean, I, I can't think of any cases where they did. Um, but yes, I mean, um, so he is then paid, this, you know, he has a disabled daughter and he's trying to support his family. Um, and yeah, so so the Dutch managed to pay um, him and it's done on the quiet because obviously they don't want to sort of damage relations with, with, with Russia. Um, yeah, I, I I think that's kind of the, the sum of my knowledge when, when it comes to um, the, the pension, yeah. Um, ah, Christina also notes that uh, there's a Scottish corner of the Breda Museum uh, and extensive archives and um, visit, a visit or contact is highly recommended. Um, mm -hmm. And that she can pass on any information. Um, so. Again, uh, to Christina, um, best to either, uh, either Jenny's Twitter account or if you pass it on to, to the SPCA, we can then uh, uh, send it on to her as well to aid in her research. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and the last question, oh, sorry. Um, the, the last question for the moment um, is from Ian Wishart. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I read uh, McGilvery's book on General Matrek quite a while ago and remember a passage about uh, Field Marshal Montgomery being particularly rude to Matrek. Uh, I'm sure the General was too gentlemanly to sink to that level, but are there any insights to Matrek's views on Montgomery? Oh, yeah, cool. Um, yes, um, he, he oh, doesn't respond well at all. Um, so the first time that they meet, um, Montgomery um, commits this massive faux pas of asking, you know, what language do, do the Poles speak among themselves? Is, is it Russian or German? Um, which, you know, that the Poles are like, dear God, we have been fighting for, for how long? And, and this is what you know about us. Um, there is a fairly charitable interpretation that he'd come across um, Poles in North Africa um, and there had been some confusion and the Poles had maybe been taken um, as Germans and so forth so I'm not sure. Um, there's also the element of Monty's dress and um, the Poles are absolutely fastidious and Monty's dress you know with, with sort of the two badges um, and you know the, 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 the scarf and complete disregard for, for any any regulations whatsoever and um, just really they, they they don't want to know what to make of it um, and yeah, that they see it as vaguely insulting. So, so there's that kind of element of showmanship. So that's kind of um, 1944. And you've also got a meeting um, after Yalta. Now, obviously the polls are still in the field um, when the terms of Yalta are revealed. And Maschek describes how um, they basically, the allies try to scope out whether the polls will want to continue to fight. So he describes a series of meetings with sort of Kreira and, and Simmons and then Monty, um, where, you know, he's schmoozed with wine and a meal and a coffee. And then eventually they bring up the topic of Yalta. And with Monty, um, you know, he brings up um, Yalta. And Monty goes, oh, don't worry about it. You can always be, you know, a Soviet general. Um, and and Matic just said, this, this was too far. He says, well, how would you like to be an American general? Um, and at this point, he talks about how the political officer sort of concentrates on stirring his coffee fairly intensely. Um, so, no, I mean, the end of his memoirs, he, he's very much, you know, he says, I could, you know, allow the sort of the showmanship and the dress to go. Um, but he really didn't show it a huge amount of uh, respect or, or understanding um, for the Polish um, situation. Um, but he says, I mean, compared to actually the Americans who couldn't care less about the Poles and the Alta. They see it as, I think, a British problem to be dealt with. Um, you know, by comparison, and um, he comes off quite well, but no, there's, there's not a lot of love left, lost there. And so any other final um, Are there any other final questions from anybody, ladies and gentlemen? Give that a moment or so. Uh, 
Well, if that's all for uh, just now, um, I'd just like to say one more time, thank you, um, Jenny, for all the effort you've put into uh, putting tonight together and providing us with a, a variety of interesting types of information for us to, to digest. I think a lot of people, many of these topics will have been completely new, even if uh, at least slightly familiar with General Maciek and his brigade. Um, so, and to everyone here, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Scottish-Polish Cultural Association for coming along to uh, tonight's talk. We're hoping to make this into a wee series of, of some sort over the next month. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out about our future events, you can find our contact details if I just share the screen again. You said very professionally. There we go. Uh, you can find us at our website or our Facebook page. Uh, and also for those of you uh, who have uh, interesting books or documents or other items uh, that might be of interest to Jenny in her ongoing research. Uh, she can be uh, contacted on Twitter or again via us and then we can pass any information on to her. But to everyone, I'd just like to wish you a very good evening and the very best of health for the coming year. Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo. Brilliant.